Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. And tonight we are going to do chapter four. And if you're wondering why we're skipping chapter three, we actually did chapter three before we started the Second Corinthians, just like a week or two before. That was the message I did on keeping liberty in the church. I did it on the anniversary Sunday evening. And um, and so I didn't want to preach that whole chapter again, even uh, even though I didn't really cover everything. But I thought, uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but, um, you know, just kind of a recap, I guess, of what we've done. You know, we did in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he's talking a lot about just some of the troubles and things that he goes through, just some of the heaviness that he had, and uh, just talks about some of the hard things that we go through as believers. You know, and then in chapter 2, he was talking about how, you know, I didn't want to make you sad. I wanted to bring you joy. I didn't want to come to you with heaviness because you all are my source of joy. You all are what uh, keep me excited. You're what keep me motivated. And he talked about forgiving others. He talked about what we believe was probably that fella in 1 Corinthians that they needed to remove from the church. He'd had his father's wife and he needed to be put out from them. But in chapter 2, he was telling them, Hey, you know what? He's been punished enough. Uh, you know, bring him back in. Love that guy back in. Do not make him think he doesn't love you. And then in chapter 3, which we talked about uh, three or four weeks ago, you know, we talked about that liberty that we want to make sure we keep in the church. And a lot of times when we try forcing things on people, okay, it's even if it's good things, we run the risk of losing the liberty we have. You know, people need, you know, I think God wants us obeying him because we want to. He, I think that's what he wants. Okay, I mean, aren't you glad y'all don't have to, like, lock your wife in the house at night to make sure she doesn't leave you? You know, aren't you glad you don't have to do that and, you know, put a tracker device around her ankle? Okay, you know, you want her to want to stay with you, Okay. And uh, in America, if she does, you know, you know she probably loves you. You know, it's not like we're in one of those Muslim countries where if, you know, she tried to run out on us, you know, we can go stone her or something like that. You know, you can't. And so uh, I think God wants that from us, too. And he wants us to be obeying him because we love him. And sometimes it's, uh, when we start forcing people to do what they should be doing, now they're doing it with a bad attitude. Now maybe they're doing it, and because they're being forced into doing it, being obedient, they have a problem now with somebody else in the church who's not being obedient. And then that's what gets the gossip going in the church. You know, can you believe so-and-so's doing this? Well, why do you care so much that they're doing that? And if you told the truth, you would admit it's because I want to be doing it, but I'm being told I can't. <laughs> and uh, that, that's not the kind of atmosphere we want in the church. And... You know, sometimes we do things wrong, okay, because we don't know what the Scripture says. You know, and a lot of times when you study the Bible, you realize, oh, man, I was doing that wrong. And the Scripture corrects us. But you know what's kind of exciting? Sometimes we do things right, and we don't even realize we're obeying the Scripture, okay? And for example, I'm going to admit something I learned from this chapter here, a philosophy that I've had since we started the church. I, don't, I guess I would say before it was really just my philosophy. But I found out after studying this chapter, it's actually biblical. And so I was like, all right, you know, I was actually doing something right. Uh, I just, I didn't realize I was doing, you know, I, did, I just was doing it because I felt like that was the thing to do. And uh, that's always exciting when that happens, when you find out what you actually did, even though you didn't even know for sure why you were doing it. It was right, and that's always a blessing. And, um, and I was encouraged by that, and I think I wanted to remind you of what chapter 3 was about because I think it will help us understand this in chapter 4 better, okay? And so one thing, you all know me. I'm as opinionated as all get out. i got an opinion on everything, okay? Usually a strong opinion, and I'm always right, or at least I think I'm always right. Uh, and so uh, you all know that about me. Um, I've got... You know what I things that I believe, things I do, and I try to and I try to teach them. But at the same time, I'm I'm just not one of these. I, I'm not an intimidating figure to begin with. Okay, you know I've always wished I was one of these you know taller preachers. You know that had the you know more size to them and the, 
you know, I'm instead of going bald, I wish when I got older I could have had the white hair so you look wiser. And I don't know, there's some preachers out there when they're preaching, you, it's like, man, I, got, I better listen to these people because they're just that scary. Okay, you know, they have that effect. I don't have it. Okay, so if I'm going to, and maybe that's why I've never been the type that I try to just beat into people's heads what they should do and try to make them do it. I guess I know I can't do it. I'm not that intimidating. And so um, my philosophy has always been, kind of my way of doing it, is if I'm going to get anybody to do anything right, I'm just going to have to find a way to prove to them from the scriptures that this is what they're supposed to do and just hope they do it. And because I can't do the other things. You know, I'm not, I'm not a Keith Gomez, okay? And I'm just, and I'm not saying anything negative about him. But man, you know, he is, he's, he's a guy, you know, he's, he's got the intimidation factor, you know? I mean, he's, you know, he's a good, good sized man and, you know, he's a, a good hunter. I mean, man, it's like sometimes you feel like when he, you know, he'll, shoot me with a bow and arrow if I don't listen to him. And you know he's not going to miss, you know, and he's just, he's one of those types. And I don't have that. You know, God didn't make me like him. And so uh, this is kind of how I do it. And, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I've said that before. And I, the way I do things is not necessarily how everybody has to do it, okay? God made me like me for a purpose, okay? And God makes other people and, and he uses them in different ways because they have different abilities. And so uh, while I say that my philosophy is biblical, it does, I'm not even necessarily saying that everybody has to do it this way. Okay? But I do believe kind of the way I do things is what Paul said he did with them. And so I found that encouraging. So let's look at what that is. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. All right, and so what the thing I want you to notice right there is the part where he says, you know, we're not handling the word of God deceitfully, okay? What's that talking about? All right, what does that mean to... You know, how, do you, how can you handle the word of God deceitfully, okay? Well, first of all, notice how he said in there, uh, we've, we have renounced the hidden things through dishonesty, okay? And I believe that's something we should do. And basically what I think he's talking about is I don't believe we ought to lie to get what we want from people, okay? I know some preachers that are really good storytellers. I mean, boy, they will get up in church and they'll start you know, preaching a message, and they'll read about two verses of Scripture, and boy, then they just go into storytelling mode. And man, they know how to tell a dramatic story, and they'll get everybody's attention, and they'll, they'll tell you this story about this person that they came across that wasn't doing what they were supposed to do, and they, they showed them what the Bible says, and they told them what to do, and boy, they just, you know, didn't listen as a result. You know, they ended up, you know, dying this horrible, violent, death and you know just I mean they can really tell these stories good and they are masters of it but you know that didn't happen okay I mean you, you, you can't necessarily prove it but you know nowadays too a lot of these preachers you know they need to be careful because you know we can fact check a lot of these things you know if they start telling about this person they didn't listen to and you know the next day their, all, their whole family got their head cut off or something well all we have to do is just search for that story on the internet we could find out if it happened <laughs> i mean there's and but it's like hey if it gets people to the altar it's okay if it'll get somebody saved it's okay and they will literally say anything to get what they want from the service they'll literally say anything to get people to make a decision, I mean, and they will just make up stories. And listen, I just, I don't do that. One, because, well, one, I don't want to lie. Two, I'm not a very good liar. And, you know, three, I don't have that good of stories. I don't tell stories that good. And, you know, my wife's always talking about how whenever I do tell stories, you know, not even in church, just talking to people that I tend to make the stories really long. And 
you know, I'm like one of those to make a long, you know, short story long instead of a long story short. And so I, that's not going to work with me telling the stories, but I do believe that can fall in the category of lying to people, handling the word of God deceitfully. And I'm telling you, man, some of these stories, they are, they're just a little too good to be true. And I'm not going to name names, but man, I know some preachers that they can't, they can tell a story and I've listened to some of these guys preach enough. You start doing the math on their stories. It's like, no, there's, there's no way this happened. I mean, they've literally been everywhere, and they've done it all. And it's like, you know what? You're only like 50 years old. How could you have done that much? I mean, you know, you literally, it's like you spent 12 years in the Army, you know, 15 years in prison, you know, 30 years in a deserted island, you know, 400 years in the ministry. And it's like, you know, you start, you, you start doing the math and all this stuff, and it's like, no, but... Man, it sure works to get a response from people. But that's not what we're supposed to do. And Paul said, you know, we, we've renounced those hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. You know, we're not crafty about this. We're not sneaky. There are some people, they know how to, you know, manipulate moods and things. And I'm going to be honest, I, I know how to do that kind of stuff. But I refuse to do it from behind the pulpit. And I do, I know how to affect atmospheres and environments and I if you if you don't think I can't you should have seen me yesterday affecting a dodgeball game I mean I I know how in sports games to affect the mood of the whole place I know how just how to react just what to do at certain moments to get in people's heads and to mess with their minds and get people mad I mean, I, don't, I, I know how to do that stuff and at ball games I'll do it because it's a lot of fun and I don't think there's anything spiritual going on there but in church I don't know if you want to do that. I mean, these people, they know how to, you know, use the music with the story. You know, they know just how to walk and how to do the dramatic pauses and all the right hand gestures. And you know what a lot of churches are getting real big into is just all the fancy lighting and stuff with all the different color lights and the mood lighting. And, you know, they got all the graphics on the screen and everything. And, I mean, they're practically putting on a theatrical production right there in church. And it's very moving. And... It can be very influential, and there are people that are very crafty. They know how to use that stuff, and Paul didn't do that. Yeah. Didn't do that. You know, I don't do that either. One said, I'm not that good at that stuff. I've tried doing, like, PowerPoint stuff, and I'm not creative enough to come up with all those things, and I'm not lazy enough to use somebody else's stuff. I, I, if I'm going to use do it. I want to come up with my own thing. And, you know, I'm not... I said, I'm not talented enough, I'm not dramatic enough, and the other thing, I just don't have the money to, you know, we don't have the money here to, to get all the lighting and effects and so we can really put on a good dramatic show here. We don't have that. Pretty much what we do, get up and read the Bible, and I do my best to tell you what it says and explain it where you can understand it. And that was what Paul did. You know, we didn't use, we've, we've renounced those things. And, you know, we're not going to use tricks of the mind, okay? Uh, go back to chapter 1 and verse 12. He said, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, which, uh, God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you, Lord. You know, he's like, we, we did these things in simplicity. You know, we did these things... We were just sincere about it. We didn't use the fleshly wisdom. Okay, I could go and do some studies on, and I'm not even saying all this is bad, but I could go do some studies on public speaking and you know how to you know, do all the right mechanics to get everyone's attention and how to put on a better PowerPoint presentation and how to use sound and lighting and all these things to just put on a better show. I could use all that stuff. I could go take some lessons in psychology and everything, to maybe know how to get into your mind a little bit better and to really know how to be creative and all that stuff. But, you know, Paul said we didn't use that. We didn't use that fleshly wisdom. We just we kept it simple and we were sincere. And that's what I want to do. I want to try to make this where, you know, what we teach here, anybody can learn it. That what we teach is something that, you know, I don't want you all to just know what Pastor Tommy thinks about how we do things. I want you to know 
what the Bible says on these things and what it means. And so we're going to be honest about how we use the scriptures. In chapter 2, in verse 17, he says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. There are sometimes people, they completely misuse the scripture. And that's something I, I work very, very hard on in preaching is, you know, a lot of times, a lot of preaching these days, people do all their points and maybe they'll use one verse and they'll use one little phrase from a verse and make it mean something. And, and then not even on purpose, but they're like, you know, okay, a lot. Of, it's like they're thinking about their message, what they're going to preach. And they're like, all right, this is what I want to preach. This is what I want to teach people. Now I need some scripture to back up what I want to tell them, which what you should do is get scripture and then just, you know, just preach that. But a lot of times we get the message and then we look for scripture to back it up when we should look for the, through the scripture to get our message. Okay. But they do. I was like, oh, I want this to be my next point. And so, okay, what would be a verse that I could use to get that point across? And then they'll think of, you know, they'll remember like one little phrase in the Bible, but not even realizing they're taking it out of context because they don't even bother going and reading all the verses before, reading the verses after. And as a result, they end up handling the word of God deceitfully. They end up corrupting the word of God. And it's amazing some of the things that are being taught that are big doctrines, even amongst Baptists sometimes, that literally come from one verse. And they will take that one verse and literally change entire doctrines or make up whole new doctrines. In fact, I believe next week we're going to be looking at one that's a real big verse that I think gets misused all the time. And it's, it's one of the main verses in a teaching that's real big and it, it's handling it deceitfully. Nobody takes the time to read all the verses before it. And what they're trying to teach, that one verse helps that argument a lot. But that's handling the word of God deceitfully. That's corrupting the word of God. And so we're going to be honest about how we use the scriptures. Okay? And, we, and man, I, I try hard to do that. You know, with a lot of uh, end time stuff and a lot of the prophecy stuff, it is so easy to just take certain scriptures, you know, one or two verses from different books and make it mean whatever you want. I was talking to somebody just yesterday about uh, Romans chapter 11. And that uh, a lot of what's taught in there, we were discussing some of the things, and, I, and he was talking about how you know, he kind of struggles with a lot of that. And I told him, I said, really, I don't like using Romans 11 to try to prove what I believe on this because I said, just to be honest, I could see how you could use a lot of those verses in there either way. I said, the way some of the things are worded in there, I could easily take those verses and argue both sides. I know, how to, I know how to do that the way it sounded. And the common person that would hear me would think, hey, he's using Bible to prove his point. But I said, some of those scriptures, it's not real clear when you look at the whole chapter. And so what you have to do to figure out what that means exactly, you have to look at what the rest of the Bible says. You know, you've got to look at these other passages that are crystal clear. And then come to the assumption that this is what Romans 11 means and proof is from these other scriptures and he said it's I don't want to get into that subject but it's easy to it, I, I see how people can take it and use it either way and I believe that's dishonest and I do my best in whatever I'm teaching to make sure I am using the scripture the way it is supposed to be used because I don't, I don't just want to use verses to deceive people and you could do that you know, I could take the Bible and I could start right there at the beginning of Genesis and I can show when God was wrong. Remember when God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of the fruit thereof, ye shall surely die? Well, what does the Bible say a little bit later? Okay, we see Adam and Eve, they eat the fruit, but you know what? Adam lived for 930 years. What happens in the day ye eat thereof? The day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Now, I could go get certain people and convince them that was wrong or that was a mistake or a mistake in the Bible. But you and I know if you handle the word of God honestly, you rightly divide the word of truth. He wasn't talking about a physical death there, was he? It was clearly a spiritual death that took place that day. 
And so, but a lot of people don't know that. And you do, you have to know who you're talking to when you're teaching, when you're preaching, and to make sure, uh, you know, said so certain groups would be a lot easier to deceive than others. You know, hopefully, I think you all are one of the tough groups to handle the word of God deceitfully on. And, uh, but there are some churches, it would be easy because the people don't have a clue. And they don't even bother trying to figure out. I mean, they don't even bring their Bibles to church. They don't need to bring their Bibles to church. They put it up on the screen for them. Well, that's convenient. Because you know what? A lot of the places, these churches, if they let, had the people with the Bible in their lap, there's a lot of things they're not going to be able to preach because those people just might look at the verses above or below what's on the screen there that totally blows their message out of the water. And, you know, are you against putting scriptures up on the screen? Are you saying, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it biblically, but I do think it's being lazy. You know, tell people to bring their, people need to bring their Bibles and they need to learn how to look through it. Okay? They need to learn how to find their way through it and church is a great place to practice that. So, you know, and when I preach, I mean, it's like doing a Bible drill. I mean, you got to go all over the place unless I'm doing like this where I'm kind of preaching through a chapter. But we're going to be honest about how we use it. We, you know, we handle the word of God deceitfully when we fail to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, you got to take everything in its context. And we're going to do our best to get people to obey because they've been convinced. Okay, not by using force. Look at what he says in verse or at the end of verse 2, he says, to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Okay? But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Okay? That's the goal for me. I want to teach people what the Bible says so they understand, so they know I'm not going to use force. Okay? And obviously right now, I've said this before, it's almost impossible for me to use force, okay? I don't get to kick your kids out of the Christian school in the church if you don't comply with the you know, rules and standards you know, held by Liberty Baptist Church. Can't, if you, I can't kick your kids out. You know, I can't, uh, all our cool sports programs and things we have, I can't take those away from you, all right? Because we don't have them. You know, we don't have all the big, fun, programs yet that many people go to church for and even follow certain teachings in the church for I don't have those to take away from you so I have no power all I have is I if I'm going to get people to do anything I've got to prove to them from the scriptures they've got to know you're not going to do it unless I can guilt you into it okay which that's only going to work for when my influence is around Okay, if I'm out of town or you're out of town, well, you can do something completely different. I mean, the Evans, you live all the way over in Chadwick. How often am I over in Chadwick? Okay, not that often. And so, you know, I don't have a lot of influence in Chadwick. You don't have to worry about, you know, seeing me, you know, or me seeing you doing something you're not supposed to do in Chadwick. You go to the gas station there and, you know, buying yourself beer. I'm not going to see it, okay? No, that's how small it is. <laughs> no, not, not even a gas station. Well, said, well, I won't see it at your neighbor's house buying drugs. All right? you know, there might be, I'm sure you got a neighbor that does drugs. You know? <laughs> but uh, I, I, won't, I won't see that. Okay? I, I won't see those things. And so if I, I know here, I, can, I have to admit, if I'm going to get you all to do anything, and I'll just be honest, it is my goal. You know, I, want, I want to get people you know, doing the right thing. I'm going to have to convince you. It's going to have to be in your conscience. Okay? Not mine. You've got to understand it. And so I've got to, I've got to do my best. And that's, there, are, listen, there are many things that I believe that I am, I am convinced of that I don't necessarily, I haven't preached yet. You're thinking, oh man, are we in for some surprises later? So why haven't you preached it yet? It's, and it, I'll tell you why. It's because I haven't figured out yet how I can preach this and teach it to where I feel like you're going to get this and you're going to understand it. Okay? It's like, I know it from my experience. I guess I feel it, but I don't necessarily know how to prove it from scriptures. You know, like maybe, you know, like certain dress standards and things. Some things aren't spelled out in the Bible, are they? 
so some of the things it's really hard to while I have confidence that I'm doing right in that area on a lot of the specifics it would be hard for me I haven't figured out how to use the Bible yet to where I can show you that this is what you're going to do and you're going to do it because it's what the Bible says not just because this is what Brother Tommy believes and what Brother Tommy teaches. And there's other things like that too that while in my mind I feel like I've got it figured out and I understand it a lot of it too might be based on just my experiences in life I don't I haven't really figured out how to communicate it yet and I'm working on it and once I do once I figure out how from the scriptures I can show this where anybody can get it and anybody can understand it I'll preach it in a heartbeat and uh, and so you know until then I'm just not gonna make a huge deal on that subject now there are some preachers out there they don't care what it is you know they'll make a great big deal out of it but then they don't ever use any scriptures and they're good at getting people to follow along with them because they're scared of them you know maybe their church is big enough it's powerful enough it's got all the programs and things and you know they got stuff they can hold over people's head you know all these people that church has been there for years all their friends are there you know they, they don't want to you know the friends are loyal to the pastor and they don't want to lose their friends uh, you know I Maybe, and they can get people to do a lot of these things that Baptists are supposed to do, and they don't even have to show scripture to get people doing it. But that's just not the way it is in most of the world. And especially when you're starting a church and you're a younger church, you're just not going to be able to do that. I've got to show it from the scriptures. And so you can ask me what I think on a lot of these things, and if you really want to know, I'll tell you what I think. But until. I can use the scripture to prove it to where you can understand it and where you'll be doing it, you know, based on your conscience and your relationship with God, you know, I'm not going to make a great big deal about it. And so a lot of preachers can call me a wimp or liberal or whatever they want, but I just, you know, until they can show more scripture to back up a lot of these things, uh, until they can communicate it in a way where the common person can understand it, Okay, now we so we all understand doing things by force. I mean, if somebody was pointing a gun to me, I'd give them my wallet. You know, I'd yeah, <laughs> here take my wallet. If they're pointing a gun at me, if they're threatening me with something, I will comply. But um, you know, I don't really think that's the method we want to use here as a church. That's not the method that I want to use as a preacher. And so. Uh, you know, gunpoint too. I, I went out shooting the other day. My shot's not that good, so I mean, people might not be that scared <laughs> if I if I use that. But um, so you know, it's got to be in their conscience. They've got to understand it. You know, and if someone's lost, sometimes people are just lost, and there's some things they're not going to be capable of understanding. Verse four or verse three. But if our gospel be hid, it is hemmed, hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them, which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There are some things that lost people aren't allowed to understand. And uh, one of the gospels, Jesus was, he gave a parable, and people didn't understand it. And the disciples asked, you know, why are you speaking to them in parables? And Jesus said, it is not given them to know the things of the kingdom of heaven. He didn't want them to know because they weren't saved. And until they got saved, until they were ready to believe on Christ and be saved, they weren't supposed to know the deeper things. That he was not going to give them those things. And there are some things that God is not going to give the lost, that is not going to understand. And there are some people that will come to church for years, and they just finally, they give up. They just, they never really got it. They tried it. They gave it a good try. Boy, they tried a good three, four, five years maybe. But they never really understood it. They never really got it. And eventually they fizzle away and walk away from it. And they just, you know, I never really got it. Well, maybe it's because you never got saved. And if, you know, the, there are some things in the Bible that's very clear. We'll teach on them to the cows come home. And there's some things that aren't real clear. And uh, even for a believer, you do have to work on it. You do have to search and they are. They're a little harder to teach. There's not, you know, it's just not spelled out. Some things, you know, they're based off of different principles in the Bible. And then there's some things, 
people just know they're not going to get because they're lost. And so that's always a possibility there. But, um, you know, they allow the God of this world to blind them. That's, it mentioned that, you know, the God of this world had blinded the minds of them because God's not going to let them see that. God's not going to let them understand the spiritual things until they get saved. So, um, very important thing to remember. But we need, so, uh, in verse 5, it says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, this is key. Because this is, is sometimes, I'm afraid, the goal of a lot of preachers is there is, now, I am as independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist as anybody, Okay. I think I fit a certain you know a certain mold to a certain extent you know uh, I diverge in certain areas I guess and get myself in trouble with that but I do fit a certain profile I guess you could say and, I, and I'm not even ashamed of that but many times people who join that you know group the independent fundamental Bible Baptist group we know how we're supposed to act we know how we're what kind of songs we're supposed to sing we know what kind of Bible we're supposed to use. We know where, how we're supposed to look. I mean, we know all that. And we, and a lot of churches too, a lot of pastors, I mean, they pride themselves on how their church looks. You know, on that all the women in our church, you know, dress this way. You know, all the men in our church do this or do that. And they make a huge deal of it. And notice how it says, you know, if we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves servants for Jesus' sake. A lot of times we have this image, this mold we try to make people conform to because it makes us look good. Okay? I'll just be honest, you know, as a preacher, there's ways that you can help make me look good if we have a guest speaker or something. And I've shared those things for you, you know, before, like, you know, if I'm not here, be here. You know, it makes me look good. You know, there, there's a lot of those things that you can do. And, and there's a lot of pressure from other preachers sometimes to make sure you stick to that stuff. OK, if I split my church because I take a strong stand on music and my church is now half the size of it was before, you know, all my buddies better make that same stand too because it's not going to be fair if their church is bigger because they didn't take a stand and, and I did and now mine's smaller than theirs. And, and so, you know, we sometimes put pressure for the wrong reason trying to get it to fit a certain image in a certain mold. And I'm just going to tell you, I like the image and the mold of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. I like it, okay? I can't help but like it. I've been a part of it all my life. But, you know, I'm not going to get up and just preach that preach Jesus Christ he's the one we're making a big deal about and if the independent fundamental Baptist mold is exactly what it should be if we get people looking at Christ and following Christ then what they transform into should be just like us as independent fundamental Baptist and so um, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have to make a huge deal about that name. If we're so close to being like Christ and what the Bible teaches, then we should be just fine by preaching Christ and, you know, not making a huge deal about our name. And so, uh, you know, just an important thing to understand about that. But verse 6, or at the end of verse 5, he says, you know, ourselves servants for jesus sake too you know a lot of times there's a lot amongst the preachers there is what i call royalty out there i mean there are there are the big shots there are the big names the ones that everyone you know loves and admires and respects and the the leaders of the movement and these guys too man some of the i mean there are some guys they're so big they're so important you know if we were to have them come and preach you know, there's there's a list of things that we're supposed to make sure we take care of. You know, got to make sure we put them in the best hotels. Uh, you know, they've got to have all these different amenities with it. Uh, you know, you got you know you're you're supposed to send a love offering ahead of time to take care of all their expenses getting here. You know, if you fly them in, you know, put them in first class. You know, you got to and listen. I'm all for taking care of people when they come, but I want it to be because we want to, not because they're making me. All right. You know, we do, we try to put people in the nicest hotel. We put, usually put them in the country and in suites if we can because it's the nicest hotel in town right now. 
and it doesn't cost a whole lot more than the other one. So, you know, that, that works good too. But that's because we want to do that. If some preacher, yeah, make sure you put me in the nicest one in town, you know, are you really being a servant? Okay, or are you being a master? Are you being a lord? And, you know, I just, I don't have any business with those people. And there's a lot of, a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on. And it's ridiculous. You know, we're supposed to be servants. Verse 6, For God, who commandeth the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay? So, as church, it's never supposed to be about the man. It's always supposed to be about Christ. And there are some churches that it's all about the man. It's all about the pastor. And listen, I understand to a certain extent, you know, when you think of certain churches, you're going to usually think of the pastor because he's, you know, he's the pastor. He's the one that people knows. He's the one that goes, you know, that maybe different meetings and everything like that. But at the same time, I mean, there's some people worship, some man worship that goes on in churches quite a bit. And it's absolutely ridiculous. And the Bible, according to the Bible, we're just servants. And not only that, it says, you know, we have this treasure in earthen, ve earthen vessels. You know, we, we have the Holy Spirit in this earthen vessel, this body that we talked about this morning that's not that great that's sinful okay the only thing good that we have going for us is what's inside of us and that's the holy spirit that's jesus christ ourselves were not that great but man i mean there are some preachers they have mastered making a big deal about the man of god and just lifting up the man of god and these it's ridiculous okay i've gone to some of these big meetings and things before and i see the royal treatment and boy it's it's pretty sad spectacle and uh you know i i it's it's tempting to get caught up in some of that stuff there's ways you can play the game and move up the ranks and get a piece of the action yourself and it's tempting you know it, it's tempting when you see it but uh not supposed to do that and we are just earthen vessels nothing that great about us and so as servants of God, you know, we are, we're, we're physically weak. But our strength, it actually comes from tribulation and persecution. Look at verse 8. It says, we are troubled on every side. After he says all this, he says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, for which we live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. So notice all these things he's been saying, you know, we've persecuted, but not forsaken. This is what's happening to us. This is what's happening to us physically. This is what's happening to our body. In the very first verse that we read, you know, he said, uh, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Okay. And the reason he's talking about fainting here is, I believe, the opposite reason most Christians are fainting today. You know why most Christians are fainting today? It's not because of physical persecution. Hey, have you ever been so tired that you felt like you were going to faint? Maybe you've been up for hours and hours. Maybe you had worked for hours and hours and you were just really, really tired and you felt like you were going to faint. You felt like you were going to pass out because you physically were just exhausted. Okay? But the problem that we have today, the reason Christians are fainting today, it's not because of anything physical we're going through. I mean, how many of us have been through a beating in the last, you know, you know, Kids, if you got spanked in last week, yeah, that's that's not what we're talking about. That's nothing, okay? <laughs> I, I get <laughs> everything. But no, I mean you know, we've not been you know beaten. How many you know how many of us have spent time in prison? You know, I mean been you know whipped you know with you know with a whip you know been stoned. We haven't faced those things, 
Okay? And in those these days, they did. I mean, how many of you literally had to run for your life this week? You know, we don't, we don't face those things. Physically, we're not facing anything in this country, but mentally, okay, mentally it's another story. And where people are feigning today, it's in the mind, okay? You know, they think they got persecuted because they're watching the news and hearing what people are saying about Christians. Oh, you know, somebody's, it, it, you know, most of our defeat that we face, it's in the mind, not in the body. But all these things he's talking about are physical things that came upon him. And then in verse um, 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Our outward man perish. We physically are dying. Okay? You know, Paul, he was constantly you know, going to prison. He was constantly, you know, physically, he suffered. Physically, he had that thorn in the flesh. At three times he asked God, to remove, but God said His grace was sufficient. Paul was a very weak man physically because of just all he faced, the burdens that he bore, and I think he thought about fainting. But then in verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, which while we look not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So note, Paul, he's talked about, you know, the, and this is really the main thing I want you to get from the message tonight, is where I want is strengthening the inward man. Okay? He said, our outward man is perishing. Okay? The suffering that he was facing, it was hurting him physically. It was hard physically, but our inward man is renewed day by day. Spiritually, God's taking care of us because we're doing the right thing. You, and you know, many people today are dying spiritually because they're not doing what God wants them to do. They're not obedient to the scriptures. They're not following the commands of God and they're suffering in the mind. They're suffering spiritually. They're not being renewed. They're giving up. I mean, people are leaving the church like crazy. People are walking away from the things of God like crazy all over this world. And I believe it's because they are not doing the things that they're supposed to do, and it's causing them to become spiritually weak. But we see that in the Bible, when we are being persecuted, when we are going through tribulation, it actually strengthens us spiritually. It makes us stronger spiritually. And you know, I find that interesting because in the time, during the early days of the church, when the church was being persecuted, I mean, the church grew like it never has before and we also see and i believe from the book of daniel that during the tribulation that i believe there's going to be an explosion of people that get saved while at the same time there's going to be a falling away there's going to be many bible talks about you know the uh people of god or the saints they're going to be doing exploits i believe there are going to be great things happening seeing a lot of people saved why because there's going to be persecution you know there's going to be a falling away as a result of that, there's going to be persecution, and I believe as a result of that, many people are going to get saved. Why? Because those Christians before that were very weak, that weren't really doing anything, once they start getting persecuted, facing tribulation, now all of a sudden they're going to become good Christians. And they're actually going to be winning people to Christ and doing what they're supposed to do. And Paul here, just notice that, that contrast. All these things we're going through, you know, we are persecuted but not distressed. Okay, that's something in the mind. That's something spiritually that you can face. And all those things, it strengthened the inward man because Paul's sufferings were, they were mostly physical. Paul was a physically weak person, but spiritually, I believe he was one of the strongest ever. And most Christians today, we've got it backwards. We're spiritually weak and physically strong. You know, we're, we're doing fine physically, but we're spiritually weak because we're carnal. And I do, I believe we would be better Christians, and I believe we would even be seeing more people get saved if we were under persecution. Okay? 
Now, I'm not going to call up Obama and say, hey, I approve of what you're doing. Keep it up, you know, so things can get worse and we'll be better Christians. I'm not, I'm not going to do that, you know. Um, I'm still going to fight that stuff, but I do think we would be better Christians. But what we need to stop being so focused on earthly things that aren't going to last and focus on the heavenly things that aren't going to go away. And so if we're going to strengthen that inward man of people, we've got to convince people what the scripture says they have to understand it okay it's great now as a parent i can make my kids do what i want them to do okay? i can i can i can force uh, you know i have i have that ability but if i don't teach it to where they get it and to where they understand it and it's now their con you know it's their conscience that is convinced that it's the right thing to do it's not going to last for long is it and we're going, to, we're going to be wasting our time. And as a result, too, of us not doing this, if we just get to where we just start a big club here that you know fits a certain profile that we're supposed to fit, what's going to end up happening, we're going to start losing our liberty. We're not going to be doing things because we're supposed to do it, because we love God. We're going to do it out of convenience sake, which is going to just make us become carnal. Okay? I mean, so it is easy to get people into church for fun stuff hard for the spiritual stuff and so if we did more fun stuff well we can start telling people you don't get to do the fun stuff unless you do the boring spiritual stuff well that's not really how we're supposed to do it and I believe if we could teach people right we could maybe actually produce some good strong Christians but we've got to strengthen that inward man and a lot of times the strength the way we get strengthened it's through trials and persecution and most believers today just aren't aren't facing it at all there and very weak and we've got to strengthen that inward man so hope that was helped you tonight so with that let's all stand together